Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and today I want to chat with you guys a little bit about where single joint exercises fit in our programming for strength training. Um, and when I say single joint exercises, the first thing that pops into people's head might be a curl or a tricep extension. And I do both of those, and they're part of my strength training, but that's actually people thinking very, very small, because a lot of people get stuck in their head that they try to use the word isolation, and I, I hate that word because there is no such thing. They get stuck in their head that they're only thinking of the single joint movements for really, really, really small muscles, right? They get stuck in the concept of just arms without realizing single joint can be single joint. Doesn't matter whether it's the shoulder, the elbow, the knee, the hip, right? To where one joint is doing the majority of the moving. Because very rarely are even these single joint exercises only one joint moving. Even a curl rarely is. A tricep extension rarely is. There's some movement of the shoulder joint even though the elbow is doing most of it. Well, something like a good morning. This is a perfect example. This is a perfect example of a single joint movement. In fact, I do very large numbers of good mornings, reverse hypers, things like that. Those are single joint exercises. Just like a curl is. Now, people will try to jump up and say, but that's not isolating any muscle. There's more than one muscle. There's at least three primary movers there. And you don't think there is on a curl? What? You don't think there's at least three primary movers on a barbell curl? Just because the bicep is the biggest muscle involved doesn't mean that... Uh, it's the only thing being worked. You're not isolating a bicep with a strict curl. Even if you're doing a concentration curl, what are you using? Brachialis? Radial brachialis? Forearm flexors? Anterior deltoid? Right? And that's assuming you're doing it super strict. Right? That's assuming you're doing it super strict. You start doing a, a cheat curl with a little bit of cheat standing we're getting all sorts of stuff involved all sorts of other muscles involved so none of these isolate anything but what we're looking at is are they focused upon moving a single joint well, where does this stuff fit in what well, fits in when we're worried about excessive loading across joints that's one of the biggest issues because we can only do so many of our really, really big barbell movements. And I understand a good morning, some people will classify it as a big barbell movement because some of us even max out on it. But it, it's a single joint exercise and it has a phenomenal stimulus to fatigue ratio, right? It's relatively easy on the physical structures of the body while still hitting certain muscles extremely hard. Uh, the same reason you do a curl or a tricep extension. So, so where do these things fit? And we'll, we'll talk about that for a minute. How about when you can't handle more training volume on the bigger exercise? Okay, you can only do so much heavy deadlifting. And there are programs out there that call for very high volumes of deadlifting, but they just destroy you. They leave your entire body hurting. They leave your bones hurting. Okay. And the argument could be made that it's not like we need a lot of movement pattern training on a deadlift. And while you can build a lot of muscle and get stronger at the deadlift doing that, the cost on the recovery side is ridiculous. But with a good morning, we can come in and work the erectors, glutes, and hamstrings very effectively with very, very large volumes of training and build all of that musculature up. Because at the end of the day, size always equals strength potential. And if we can hypertrophy those muscles, that's most of the muscles involved in the deadlift, not all of them. Right? As long as you do other stuff to make sure your upper back is built up. Make sure your grip is built up. Make sure that you do some stuff where you can actually acclimate to the heavy loads. Right? The good morning will we'll build... 50% of the musculature involved in the deadlift. Build 50% of it. But it will do so without crushing you. And it's not to say we shouldn't be deadlifting every week with it. We do. I do. I do speed pulls every week. I, I pull a max every other week. In addition to doing the speed pulls. So some weeks I'm pulling twice a week. We still do the good mornings. 
Okay, this is where they fit into strength training. Well, well how about curls and tricep extensions and fly? Like, that's great. The exact same mindset would be applied, although they're a bit smaller. Triceps an enormous part of the bench press. Now, when you look at the size of the tricep, when it actually gets measured and, and looked at when, when they're developed, the tricep actually it can be as big as a pectoral. We could argue the tricep could be up to 40, in some cases 50%, but at 40% of the muscle involved on a bench press. How much heavy benching can you do before your shoulders really just start to, to not be able to handle it? Right? How much benching volume can you get away with? Only so much. What's what's the downside of benching for triceps? Well, the novice lifter triceps will grow fine on the bench. As you get more advanced, we find that the tricep activation doesn't always peak out on, on benching. Even though they contribute heavily, and it might be 40% of the muscle involved, it doesn't always get maximum stimulation. It's almost like a half muscle use. But my God, does it contribute to the strength. So if you're only benching, you may not even reach the, the minimum effective volume to make your triceps grow. So you might very well benefit from doing some tricep exercises to bring your triceps up to increase your bench. Because if it's accounting for up to 40% of the muscle mass involved in the bench, even if it doesn't get peak activation, particularly the long head, the lateral and medial heads sure get, get used a lot. But again, we can't always do enough benching without chewing our shoulders up and creating inflammation in our shoulder joint to really maximize tricep development. And given that the triceps are one of the primary movers and account for a huge amount of the muscle mass, wouldn't we want maximum tricep development? Won't that help your bench press? Of course it will. And then what about any other press that is even less chest dominant? You start doing overhead pressing or anything, those triceps will pay off tremendously. Same thing, you see me doing some curls here. People are like, well, you do tons of back pulling. Why do you need curls? Well, because my arms don't grow particularly good for one, and I have torn a bicep and have a piece of my bicep cut out by a medical doctor many, many years ago, well over a decade ago at this point. So why would I do biceps? Well, to make them bigger, but let's say I do tons of inverted rows. You guys know I do feet elevated inverted rows four days a week. Why don't you do pin lays? Because I do so much reverse hypers. My lower back doesn't need the extra work. I don't need the extra posterior chain work. I maximize my posterior chain development. Inverted rows don't cause me issues there. Well, for me sometimes, my arms become a weak link in my pulling. I have a very, very, very strong back. It's been demonstrated for you guys many times. I deadlift over 600. You guys have seen me do weighted chins with up to 100 pounds. Right? I do a ton of rowing these days. I don't do any chins or pull-ups these days. I used to do 100 chins every day. So, I don't do those anymore. I sometimes find my biceps become the weak link in my pulling, my upper back pulling. Well, I need more upper back. I need that for my squat, bench, and deadlift. You cannot have too much upper back development for strength. Okay. Well, sometimes my biceps historically seem to get really fatigued on some of my rowing. All right. Now, the data does show that biceps tend to get very, very heavily recruited and could, in theory, get maximum growth from all that pulling. But in my case, I run into a work capacity issue with my biceps. Because I do a lot of pulling, sometimes my biceps start giving out. They need more work capacity. Well, what's the only way to get more work capacity? Well, I'll probably do some curls. Right? Probably to do some curls. So that my biceps have the extra work capacity to do all the rowing that I need. And all the pulling that I need. And I find that when I start training my biceps, my rowing strength in general tends to improve. At least my works, that's my ability to do, uh, you know, a lot of weight for 10 or 12 reps. For multiple sets, it, it's enhanced by the bicep work. Let's come over to the point we can only handle so much rowing before things like our lats start cramping, our rear delts start cramping. All right, my rear delts definitely one of those. Some, some of the parts of my, my upper back really cramp up on some of these movements if I do too much volume. 
but my biceps don't. So that means my biceps still have some strength in reserve also sometimes. Right? They have recovery in reserve. Biceps tend to recover pretty easy. So, so I do some extra curls. And if I do extra curls and it improves my work capacity on my rowing, and my rowing helps all my other lifts, the curls make me stronger. Right? This isn't a difficult concept to, to understand, guys. This is where we fit single joint movements in. This is their place. That's how they work in a strength program. When you need the exercises that are easier to recover from, to work a lot of the muscles that are involved in the big lifts, but you can't handle more volume on the big lifts. All right, guys, well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.